Dr. Connie Unger is the breeder of SEBA, the 2020 Westminster Kennel Club Best in Show, who is going to share a number of her thoughts um, and experiences from an accomplished career in the dog breeding community. So let's welcome Dr. Unger onto the stage. All right, um, welcome, Connie. Thank you, John, for that introduction. And um, I really thank um, Embark for having such a great seminar. I mean, Dr. Sams just influenced me a whole lot this morning as I listened to him. And yesterday was equally um, important to me. So I really appreciate that you have uh, prepared something like this because this takes a lot of, of preparation. Um, and I think so far it's really gone uh, beautifully. Um, so well, I thank you. you for having me. And, and I would like to br uh, share some of my ideas about uh, breeding and health um, that I've done. Um, but now I'm even going to tweak it more after this seminar. I think we need more seminars like this because then more people can be more informed in their, in their breeding program. That's right. So I really think. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, that's certainly the goal. I mean, when we think about um, Embark's mission to um, improve canine health, you know, we kind of start looking more specifically, who are the people who can really make a difference in that and what are the tools and information and services they need? So it kind of naturally led us to putting a program together for breeders. And this conference is, while predominantly breeders in the audience, we also have a number of veterinarian scientists, dog owners, and just canine enthusiasts. And, and together, that's that's all of the pieces. So, um, so excellent. Well, thank you very much for that. We'll now have you um, share your thoughts uh, for you know 30 minutes or so or however long, and then I'll actually come back on screen here to pose some, some questions to you directly. Um, and I just wanted to highlight for our, our audience just a few, a few facts, um, Connie, about your background, which is that your approach is to carefully breed for personality, style, movement, and above all, to produce dogs that love to be with people. Uh, you are an AKC breeder of merit and have bred a number of champions and grand champions. Dr. Unger is the breeder owner of GCHP Stone Run Afternoon Tea, SEBA, the Poodle Club of America Best of Show, Royal Canaan National Dog Show Reserve Best of Show, and Best in Show at Westminster in 2020, shown by Crystal Class. So, so thank you again, and uh, we look forward to hearing your talk. Okay, thank you, John. That was a, a very nice introduction. Um, I've had dogs all my life. I had uh, mini poodles. I've had commodores. Uh, I've had rescue dogs. <clears throat> and then finally, my true love, standard poodles. And uh, I just fell in love with that breed. Um, I am the breeder of, of Seba and, and other uh, poodles. And one of the dogs that's out right now is Skye and uh, watch for her in the 2021 Westminster. Um, let me start by sharing my story, and I think it's similar to most breeders who are serious about breeding to meet their breed standards and to create fantastic companion dogs with longevity, because every show dog becomes a companion dog, as Seba is my companion dog right now. Um, I'm gonna start with I think all breeders go through different stages and I, I see the stages of as scribbling as development and then making choices. So I'm going to start with scribbling. Uh, finding the best foundation bitch is really very key. Um, my first girl um, was a champion. She was beautiful. She was very smart, uh, fantastic structure and, uh, great health, clear, clear health in every aspect. Um, the one thing that I would say about her is she was in my eyes, small. Um, maybe I'd like a, a big things, but she was small in, in what, what I saw as my ideal poodle. Um, and I did find a beautiful stud dog that was, I always try to breed up who I felt was better than, than she was. And uh, the two, two of them had a great litter. Um, I think I had eight. And um, 
I out of that one litter, I did have two champions. So it wasn't that she, and she was a great mom. Um, it wasn't that, but every time I looked at her, I thought, I'm not too sure if, if you're the one that is, I'm going to use for my foundation, bitch. And I, and I kept looking around for a, another dog. And I did find a second dog and she was bigger and her parents had great health testing. So I gave her to my handler and he started showing her. And then um, I uh, started the health testing because some of the tests you can do before there too. And I found out that she was a carrier of any. Um, wasn't overly excited about that because I, I really felt that my foundation bitch should be clear of everything. Um, and then I did another test and she was a carrier of Von Wilderbrandt, uh, VWD, and that did it. Um, I called the breeder who was the co-owner and said, I cannot breed this dog. I'm going to give you back. I'm going to give her back to you. And please, when you find another home, um, pass these health papers on and make sure the, it's a limited registration. Make sure that the person does not breed her. Um, I think the breeder didn't um, recognize what I was saying. Um, and uh, she sold her to a, a groomer. And actually the groomer and I became friends and I sent her all the health papers, which she had not received before. Um, sending her all the health papers. And I thought, okay, now we have, she has a happy home, um, safe home, and I'm not going, she's not going to influence the breeding world. And lo and behold, in about two or three years, I get an email. Uh, the groomer says, oh, all my friends want a puppy from her. And, and, you know, I think I'm going to breed her. Well, I coached her not to breed her, uh, but she did breed her. And that was the end of our relationship. Um, so that did not turn out really well. I hate to give her back, but, uh, you know, that was my only recourse because I was the only co-owner of her. In the meantime, um, uh, I did find another girl, uh, that was a little bigger, um, that when she was a puppy, she had a super personality. I loved the way she walked. Movement is a big thing for me. Um, and, I gave her to my handler and she became a champion and then she became a, a, a grand champion. She did show at the Westminster a Poodle Club of America. And um, when she came home, I did, I did her testing and she was clear of everything, which I was really pleased with. And she continued to have that wonderful, wonderful personality that I was looking for. I like calm, confident dogs that aren't crazy, wild, uh, love people, as, as John alluded to. Uh, so she had the personality plus. And then she did have an excellent pedigree. Um, she was the great granddaughter of Afterglow the Big T's. That was an English dog that won at Crufts, best in show at Crufts. Uh, so her pedigree was excellent. And I thought, okay, I found, I think, my foundation bitch. And... Um, from there, I realized if I was going to breed her, I had some decisions to make. I, What did I want my line, Stone Run, actually to look like? Um, what, what was going to happen? And that's where you get into development because now you have to develop, develop a plan. What were you going to do? Now, my goal was to, to show and to breed the best dogs that I could, great personalities, um, adhering to the breed standards. Um, so what, what was I going to focus on in my line uh, to make it a little unique from other lines? Well, health and longevity. And that was alluded to by Dr. Sams and, and on, on Monday. Um, I really wanted um, dogs that were clear of everything um, that were very athletic. Um, and, and with that, it seems like, if I talked to people, I could find out how long the their parents lived. Um, structure and movement was another pil pillar. I have four pillars. Um, structure and movement, and I, I feel that um, if the dog is put together right, it's going to move correctly, it's going to stack correctly. Um, 
I feel it's going to have fewer health issues. I mean, there's no, I do not have any research to prove that, but my dogs are really, really healthy. Uh, another thing that was important to me uh, was the temperament and personality. I wanted the dog to um, be attuned to people, um, be happy, um, very quiet, but yet enthusiastic about doing different things. And uh, very, I'm going to say intuitive to people, you know, can they read uh, what's going on? And uh, so that was important to me. And the pedigrees, I, I do, AKC has done a fantastic job with pedigrees. And um, I can go back 15 generations and look at everything that's going on with pedigrees. Um, and, I, and I do talk to um, older people than myself, believe it or not. And um, they have uh, a wealth of information about who was who, 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 whose sister and brother and all that kind of thing for the pedigrees. So pedigrees are another, uh, is the fourth point point of my development. Uh, how do, what do I want to focus on? Um, and then I thought to myself, okay, how am I going to get here? Uh, I'm, I'm a very little breeder. I, um, uh, I, there's not a lot of poodle people in where I live, uh, virtually none. Um, how do I, how do I get to where I want to go? And I s started to think about workshops. Um, I attended every workshop that I could find. I attended several of Pat Hastings workshops and she's going to be a uh, presenter later on today. Um, I, I went to um, breeding workshops, fertility workshops, uh, grooming workshops, um, puppy care workshops, um, everything that I could find, I went to. Uh, even if I had to travel a, a good distance, I, you know, I have, I have a great car, I can travel. Um, then I started to look at books. Um, I bought a lot of uh, poodle books. I bought um, How to Become a Champion, all those kinds of books. And one of my favorite books uh, was The Monks of New Skeet and How to Raise uh, Puppies. Uh, they're from New York State. And and I do follow some of their ideas. I do not use a t uh, swimming pool tub for whelping, but uh, some of their other ideas are just absolutely great. From there, I started to look at some magazines. I think we overlook magazine articles. Uh, the pictures are always great, uh, but there are some great information in the magazines. Uh, of course, I would go to Poodle Variety, and then I started to go to Dog News, and then Canine Chronicles, and even AKC um, has um, news articles um, that you can link to them on the internet. And I would, of course, Google things, and I used YouTube um, if I wanted to know different information about uh, uh, breeding dogs. Uh, one of the things that that I sort of like missed out on, and I and I think a lot of new breeders miss out on, is a mentor. Um, I know probably any poodle person would have helped me, uh, but I, I didn't even know the questions to ask. Um, and I think a lot of good breeders just do everything automatically. You don't even think about what you're doing. You don't sit down and analyze. Um, like I, I've said to a number of great breeders that I wish they would write a book so that people that were coming into the breeding could be guided by their, their wisdom. Um, so I do think that there's something, and it was alluded to on Monday, about having a mentorship, mentoring people. It's it's a wonderful idea. And we could somehow link new breeders to experienced breeders. Um, I, I think that would be that would be a great summit, um, just as a, a side idea. Um, another thing I had to think about, and this sounds really strange, how will I emotionally handle being a breeder? And by that, I meant um, w when I had to give away um, the girl, uh, it, it really broke my heart. And as a breeder, you have to be prepared to give away your dog so that they have a better life. Uh, my first girl, 
Um, I was able to find a wonderful home. A friend of mine lost their dog. Their two little girls were very, very sad. And um, my my first girl was available. And I said, well, do you want to keep the girl for a week or two until your little girls get over losing their dog? And so um, they would send me pictures of my girl in baby clothes, which I never thought, or little kids clothes. I never thought that she would tolerate that uh, in hats, uh, in boots, um, in a baby carriage, all kinds of things. And that girl was so happy in that environment that, that we decided that that was the best home for her. Um, and you do have to be prepared to perhaps rehome your girls. I try to keep a girl from a show girl from every one of my litters. So you can imagine, uh, uh, you know, uh, the number of, of dogs I have. Um, I have a very, I live out in the country and I have probably about five to six acres in fence in the front yard, and the backyard. So they have lots of room. Um, but, uh, that's, that's the way I've, I've decided that I would rehome my older girls. Many people do not do that. Many people keep all of their girls or girls and boys, which I can't imagine doing. I do not keep any boys. Um, I can't imagine doing that. Um, and other people um, have to give up their dogs, even if they don't want to, because of the strict rules of their township or borough. Um, I, like I said, I'm very lucky. Um, uh, I'm, I'm fine with how many dogs I would like can, can manage basically. Um, and, uh, so I'm, 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 I'm just warning you that you do have that emotional, um, cause you do, they're, they're part of your family. Um, and so it's, it's hard to rehome any of them. But so far, I've been very, very fortunate that my girls have, have gone to better places than here. Um, and so that's part of making choices. And that's the next part. Uh, what choices do you have to make? Well, you have to make a choice of who are your breeding bitches? Um, will they all be champions? What will their temperament be? And one thing, there's no wiggle room on this temperament. It, there's no wiggle room on champion, eh, you know, but temperament. And the last thing is health. Uh, I do really stress uh, they need to pass all their health tests and the DNA testing that Embark is doing has really uh, been an asset, I think, to any serious breeder. Um, I have all my girls um, have DNA tests. I used the different DNA tests before Embark came about. And so I, I know a lot about my girls before I breed them. Um, I don't necessarily breed them to my show boys that people have. Um, I normally reach out. So I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with um, the coefficient of my girls. Um, although I've only used pedigrees, I've never thought of using um, Embark's method of doing it. Um, and then the next question um, oh, is um, who will your girls be bred to? Uh, who's going to be the stud dog? And the first thing I would say to any breeder, and I'm sure all breeders do this, um, ask for the health testing papers. Um, I, I need my stud boy to be clear of everything, um, have good hips, have good eyes, uh, and carry carry no known diseases that we have markers for. Um, and I, I think that's, that's very, very important. Um, I actually try to meet the dog in person because uh, in-person knowledge of the dog really helps you. And that's why dog shows are so important that they, of course, we can't have them now, uh, only in Florida, but um, in, you know, dog shows are really important because you can go and, and visit the dog that you're thinking about perhaps using. Um, you can find out his temperament. Uh, you can have put your hands on him and find out his structure. Um, and often you can chat sometimes anyway, with the handler or owner of the dog. And that way you can find out a little history of the parents. Um, are they still alive? How long did they live? Do you know anything about the great grandparents? And just um, an oral history of 
of the the stud dog is often very helpful. I always, of course, rely on the pedigrees. I I tend to follow the mother line. I I like my mothers are very very dominant, um, and I tend to try to follow the mother line uh, when I'm looking for different stud dogs. Uh, a good example of that, and this may be totally wrong, but um, I have a girl named Myla. Uh, Myla is the great, great, great granddaughter of the dog I mentioned before, Afterglow the Big T's, known as Donnie. Um, I actually knew Donnie when he was in the United States. My handler handled him. Um, and so I got to have that in-person meeting with Donnie. Um, and of course, I mentioned before, Donnie did win Crufts. So he was an absolutely outstanding dog in structure and in movement. Um, recently, I was fortunate enough to find a grandson of Donnie um, who was black, and that's rare for Donnie. Donnie normally always had white. Um, and he's a grand champion and great um, health testing. And the people who own them are also great. So because it would, they live in the West Coast. And so we would do um, a collection, a ship, and then do transcervical. Um, and so uh, that's, that's what I mean by I try to follow the, the, mother, the mother line. Um, and I always try to breed up. I, I look for traits in my dog. And then I look for... Uh, traits that could improve my dog in the stud dog, um, but following always the, you know, the pedigree. Um, and one of the things that sounds really strange, but maybe it's just in the poodle world, I don't know. Um, and there are tons of stud dogs. We are not limited in our genetic pool. Um, the cooperation of the dog owner, um, you, you need to confirm with them if they're willing to work with you. Uh, believe it or not, that has been an issue. I mean, I've had people that um, are, are not willing to work with you, will not collect, will not ship your girls in heat. You pre-plan this and now they bulk on you. Um, it really is important um, that you know the stud dog owner, you have some kind of relationship that they're willing to uh, work with you, even if it's dog to dog. Um, because I, I do depend heavily on progesterone testing. And, uh, when my girl's ready, I, I, I need to, uh, have the, the stud dog owner ready also. Um, uh, something else that, uh, I think has really, really improved, is, um, is the, are the, is the health testing over the years. Um, there are more and more markers, uh, Early on, there weren't markers for NE, um, and um, that's that to me is really important. Um, so uh, we need more markers, and I'm glad to hear that there's more research um, being done on, especially Addison. Um, I would love to have a marker because that would definitely influence my breeding program. Um, I'd like to have a marker. Okay, we do have some testing for SA, but I really don't know how valid it is. I could be way off, but um, I think it would be wonderful if we had more testing for SA. Um, and of course, the big C, cancer. Um, I think all dogs uh, have a problem with cancer, and I don't know whether it's genetic or environmental, but it would be nice if we had some kind of marker or indicator that um, your dog may be uh, susceptible to cancer. And that would certainly influence uh, good breeders. Um, the DNA test has just been wonderful. Um, like I said, all my dogs have the DNA testing done. Um, hips seem to be pretty standard. Uh, now there are two ways of you can test hips, although AKC only recognizes the one. Um, and eyes, of course, um, to get that done yearly to make sure. Standard poodles don't normally have an eye issue. Uh, minis do, uh, different breeds might. Um, we don't worry about elbows or things like that. That has not been an issue with, with, um, with poodles. Um, and I really depend on my vets. I have a vet that's local and I have a, like a fertility vet that I have to travel some distance 
uh, to go to him. And he's a breeder himself. So he is, is absolutely wonderful. Um, so I do think that we need to depend on our vets and, and try to educate them. And I know yesterday that the, the, uh, the chat about um, neutering the dogs. I'm one of those people that's in my contract that until the growth plates close, uh, they should not neuter their their puppy. Uh, poodles, um, if you neuter them early, I, I think they they don't mature like you really want them to mature. But that's just the personal, absolutely a personal opinion. Um, I have I have really no concrete research that I've done to to verify that. Uh, something else that I think is really, really important um, in the poodle, uh, in all breed world are our dog clubs. And I'm afraid that um, they're disappearing. Um, and, and I really am a proponent of, of joining a dog club. I hope everybody here is a member of some dog club. I'm on the board of the Lehigh Valley Kennel Club. I'm on the board of the poodle, Lehigh Valley Poodle Club. Um, and I really think they, they really not only give you a community of dog lovers, uh, but also do a, a lot of good. They're always there to help. Uh, but the good that they do is they, they do organize the dog shows and they run them. And we're all volunteers. Um, and I, I think that's for the dog community, having dog shows, let it be confirmation, obedience, agility, fast cat. Uh, there's so many things that clubs can run these days. It's, it's wonderful. Um, another thing our club does, um, both clubs actually have health clinics, um, that they bring in great doctors and they do eye testing, heart testing, um, vaccinations, um, blood draws, uh, all kinds of things that, uh, are really nice for the purebred breeder, but also for the community. It's, it's open to the community. Um, along with that, um, I'm fortunate enough that, um, my uh, clubs, um, uh, sponsor workshops. And I said, that was uh, something that I really focused on in the beginning, um, to, to get more information, uh, to network with people and what have you. And, um, our, our clubs sponsor workshops, um, which, um, is, is I think a, a valuable thing. Um, and uh, I don't know if we have time. I should probably ask John if I have time to, to get, tell a little story or should we do questions? Okay. Um, I don't know if, if people have seen Seabor or not, but um, I'd like to take this time and tell a story. I'm going to tattle on Seba. Uh, and it is a tattle. Uh, my handler hates for me to mention this, um, uh, but Siva was one of, uh, from a litter of eight, I normally always have large litters. And in my breeding program, um, I do, I do not normally do the inbreeding, uh, the Dr. Sams was talking about. Um, I really try to keep a distance of, of at least four generations away. Uh, but Siva was a litter of eight, four girls, four boys. Um, and, uh, I raised all my puppies, um, uh, in my house and I raised them as though everyone was going to be the next Westminster winner. Lo little do I know, um, that it really happened. Um, but I, in other words, I, I have them on the grooming stand. I brush them. Um, I stack them. I let them run it in the yard. And watching them run in the yard, um, I immediately started to see that this little puppy with the red collar uh, was absolutely outstanding. Uh, she already at uh, five weeks, six weeks, she was, her movement was fantastic. Um, so I still like thought that she might be the pit dog, but I was not sure. At four weeks, I normally have a friend of mine who's a professional uh, groomer, a master groomer. She and I, uh, groom the puppies for the first time. She sets the pattern. Um, and, uh, it gives me an idea for the next time how to groom them, uh, feet, face, and tail basic is what we groom. And, uh, my little red collar girl, which was Siva, uh, was extremely challenging. Uh, 
uh, the kind of dog you would say you really don't think she has a career in the show world. Um, at six weeks, I do it myself. I groom them myself. And um, I had to groom her on her terms. When she felt like letting me uh, shave her face, uh, her feet, and her tail, that's what we had to do. At eight weeks, when my groomer came back again, uh, she and I both struggled with her. And we basically said, gee, I hope this is not the one. And we both laughed at that because um, who would ever pick a dog that couldn't be groomed, especially if it's a poodle? Um, and it really did worry me because I had liked her movement and her structure. And um, I was worried that she didn't care much for grooming, um, but I couldn't take my eyes off of her. And lo and behold, she was the... the uh, dog that was picked and she loved running with the older girls in the yard. She always had a stuffed toy in her mouth, running around, prancing around, almost like floating. At three months, I said, oh, okay, we're going to go to handling classes because I always like to pre-train the dogs before I give them over to my handlers. So we went to handling classes and it was absolute disaster. Um, she threw up all the way in the car and every time we went to handling classes, she was throwing up. Uh, she wouldn't walk on lead. I mean, I could say, oh, she could do it at home, but she wouldn't do it there. She wouldn't do it. Um, she would not walk on lead. She wouldn't go into the show ring. Uh, she seemed like she was afraid of everything, which was atypical for her. Um, and then three weeks went into it, and I thought, well, this girl's never going to be a showgirl. And then finally, she became friends with the Brittany. And she and the Brittany hit it off for some strange reason. Or we were waiting each time. Uh, the Brittany was right there. And she started following around the Brittany. And that's how I got her to go into the show ring for the first time. Uh, it, it was just amazing. But Seba had a natural stack. Um, she had a beautiful gait in spite of me. Um, and from the very first, I, I thought, wow, she's really fantastic. Um, at six weeks, um, Siva went to my handler at six months. I'm sorry. At six months, uh, Siva went to my handler, um, and she was going to practice her, uh, you know, doing her own way of handling her, uh, which was much better than mine. And she was ready for her first show at six months, one week. And I watched her in the ring and I couldn't believe that the judge was putting her up. The judge put her up again. And lo and behold, at six weeks, one week, six months, one week, um, she became best of variety of that show. And um, as my handler was walking out, she turned to me and said, I think we have something special here. And of course, that started Seba's journey. Um, Seba didn't like traveling, um, and she was groomed on her terms. Uh, when she felt like it, but of course she was always beautifully groomed. Uh, but the one thing that motivated her to tolerate, I think, the grooming was that she loved the spotlight. When she went into the ring, it was like magic. The more people clapped and cheered, the better she liked it. Um, she was, uh, uh, oh, she, one of the things she always did from little, when she was a little puppy, she always stretched before she did something. And that's what she did. She took that with her into the show ring. She always did a little stretch before the competition, like all athletes do. Um, and today, like I said, she's my wonderful companion dog. She's my shadow. She's right here. Um, she never leaves my side. And now she loves traveling with me. Anytime I go, say I'm going to go bye-bye, she's right at the door ready to go with me. Um, I don't need a lead. She just jumps into the car and um, – She's just a, a great, great dog. So that's my little story about uh, Seba behind the scenes. Um, and Jonathan, if you're ready to hop in with some questions. We're ready for some questions. So thank you very much, Dr. Unger, for your talk. That was very, very interesting and informative both. So we really appreciate it. So uh, one note about Seba. I love that, that story about Seba, but I was, um, I was there at Westminster last year um and it was an amazing sight seeing her win so that was uh that was really cool to be there i think we all are hopeful 
and eager to get back to dog shows and other canine sports and being able to do it in person, hopefully sometime soon. Um, but for now, we'll make the most of these virtual events and try to get all the all the learnings we can out of it. Okay, I totally agree with you there. Yeah, so uh, first, so I'll be presenting just a number of questions we had submitted from our viewers. Um, and I wanted to start uh, with one here that just says kind of simply, how have your views on or experiences with canine health testing changed over time? Um, I, I value it more. Um, there's more information to be had, so therefore there's more to value. Um, I, I definitely, like I said, um, uh, with the markers that we do have, um, I, I wouldn't even consider um, using a stud dog without all the testing. Um, I don't, I, I was aware of it and sensitive to it, but uh, now I am, I, I, it is, it is one of my, it was the first thing on my pil pillar of, of what I was going to focus, focus on in, in my line, because nobody wants to breed unhealthy puppies and to have unhealthy puppies out there in the world. Uh, you really want, um, as a responsible breeder, you want really great puppies. Uh, nothing makes me happier than, uh, I mean, if you go to my, uh, website or to Facebook, um, you see all the, all the happiness that uh, healthy, good puppies can bring to people. Um, and that's, that's, right. that's what I really like. That's great. That's great. So on, um, on a related note, I think there was a question from Marsha, uh, who asks, you spoke about making your line unique. How does this fit in with preserving the breeds character, health and purpose? Have you developed guiding principles for your breeding program? Well, unique, in other words, I had the four, four pillars um, that I really rely on. Um, and within the breed standard, um, it does mention temperament, uh, but I'm not too sure how big that is. But you, I mean, for me, that's, that's one of the, the keys. Um, so that's how I so like make it unique. Um, by focusing on the on the health and longevity, longevity structure um, and movement. Movement is people can identify my dogs in the ring by just watching them move. Um, and you know they do have a unique characteristic about them. Um, mm -hmm. So that that's sort of like what I do. I mean, uh, temperament is very important. Um, and you know, really, the good pedigrees. Got so it. All the breed standards, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and we're going to, um, you know, we've heard this mentioned, I think, a few times by different presenters, and I know some upcoming panels will touch on this as well. But you know, it, it's it's kind of thinking about the bigger picture or like the complete picture. You know, a great breeding program isn't about any one thing. It's not about just health testing, whether in the clinic or genetic temperament, character, training, it's all of these things. Um, so, so thank you. So that's helpful. Um, there's been a number of questions, I think, about, you know, your use of health testing, um, genetics and, and, and inbreeding. So let me just ask a few of these here. Um, we heard earlier from Dr. Sams about how inbreeding can negatively affect dog health and litter size, um, yet line breeding is a fairly common practice and is often planned by using, you know, the paper pedigree charts and pedigree records. So can you just share a little bit about how you think about using line breeding, balancing it with health and, you know, have your views changed on this topic over the years at all as well? Uh, probably it, it definitely has. I'm, I'm far more sensitive um, to, um, line breeding and um but you have to remember that all my dogs have a relationship perhaps none at all so it's totally uh, another another kind of, of breeding um than than within my line many many pool breeders do bring back into the line because you that's the way you get your look of the dog that you want it to be um but i do use um, other uh, people's 
uh, dogs, stud dogs. So I, I don't really, and my litter sizes are 10 to eight. Um, so I don't have an issue with, with litter sizes. And I do think that I am, I'm reaching out far enough in the background um, that uh, I'm trying to pull some of the good things uh, that maybe the dog had and the good things that my girl has. Um, and I, I do use the pedigree. I have been using the pedigree um, coefficient more than um, the, you know, the, the uh, embark way of doing it. And I certainly will, uh, uh, you know, think about that in the future. So thank you very much for, for answering those questions and sharing your talk earlier. Okay, I appreciate it. And thank you for having this. I really do think that we need to have more of these. It's, it's really been a, a great uh, learning experience for me and I think anybody that has been watching it. So thank you again.